welcome to the Empowering Perspective Podcast. I am your host, Dwayne Dwyer, and today I have the privilege of talking to my good friend, Mr. Roland Walker. Roland, welcome back to the show. You know, I always appreciate you, uh, you know, hanging with the low lives. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not a low life, sir. You're always value added whenever you're around. Yeah, man. You, you, you've definitely shown yourself to be a, not just a good person, but a good friend. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And, that's, and, and you know what? That's just kind of like what we as mature men, um, that's what we aspire to be, right? You know, yeah. we aspire to be value added in other people's lives. And, you know, it's funny that you actually mentioned that because that's really kind of how, like how we connected through the conversations that we've had over the last few months. If you guys remember, um, Roland was on the show a few months back and we talked about toxic masculinity. Mm-hmm. Um, so for those of you who've seen that show, this is the young man that gave us such valuable insight when it came down to the, that particular topic. For those of you who have not seen it, I'm telling you, go watch it. If you have not watched it yet, I'm telling you, you're missing a, a great show that had a, a lot of valuable information um, that we talked about. And through the conversations over the months, you know, I participated on some of his platforms as well. Um, and then we just got together and we decided to, hey man, we need to come together and just have a continual conversation. Um, and uh, one, I, I was driving down the street one day, if, just if I can share this, and uh, I was listening to a song and, and, and the idea just popped in my head and I called him real quick. I said, hey man, I got to share it with you. And so I, I shared the idea, man, and <laughs> he sat on it for a minute, but then he came back full circle and said, yeah, I like that. We, we can go with it. And so the idea was, uh, you know, we were going to come together And we were going to have conversations on a regular basis, two mature adult males, and we're going to talk from the perspective of the hearts of men. And I think when you really stop and, you know, think about that idea, I just believe that these conversations will literally add value to the lives of the younger male or the younger men. Um, And that's kind of like how I looked at it. Roland, if you don't mind, would you kind of share your perspective based upon the conversations that we had previously, sir? Uh, I'm right there with you. And I think that we both noticed that sometimes we can try to put men or just males in a box and say, well, we all like we all should act the same way, respond the same way and be thinking on the same wavelength when in actuality we, we were all raised differently and we have different experiences to bring to the table. And when a man doesn't feel valuable with his experiences, he'll turn solely to what he knows and everything else he'll throw out the window. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And, and, and I want to add to what you're saying too, because a lot of that not feeling valuable with his experiences can come from, kind of like conversations we had previously, come from his upbringing, come from not learning how to uh, harmonize with some of his emotions, things of that nature. And then unfortunately, you know, I just want to be honest, people kind of default to what they know. And unfortunately, that default reaction can lead to, you know, not necessarily handling things or people in the most valued way. So I think that's kind of like what we end up seeing. And that's kind of and again, that's what brings us here. We just simply want to add value to the lives of young men so that they did I say men some men. I think I said, you said men. men but okay. Yeah. <laughs> hey, the country coming out. It did, man. <laughs> <laughs> to the lives of mans. No, I'm joking. <laughs> so <laughs> we just want to add value to the lives of men so that they can, you know, be the pillar of their communities and be the protector, provider, and an emotionally intelligent being for the sake of the healthy well-being of his family and his children as well. Um, and I think that, you know, I think that's really where we're going because I would tell you from my perspective, that would have added a significant amount of value to my uh, to my life and prevented me from going through some of the things that I went through. How about you, sir? Uh, <clears throat> I'm with you because I think everything you said in a nutshell is wrapped up in being responsible having responsibility and the men that have come up these past few generations they really haven't had to be responsible Mm. like uh you know when we grew up we had chores you didn't do your chores you didn't get you it wasn't no well i'm gonna cook this if mama made that no you eat what was on the table you either ate it wet or dry yeah. You can eat it crying or you can just eat it. Yeah. And 
our males have been almost feminized in a sense not to the point that they're women but they have more female mannerisms yeah. when it comes to being responsible for the family yeah. being responsible for your 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 community being responsible for even your actions yeah. because every time something happens is they got an excuse no excuses aren't necessary fix the problem yeah. and we need to have ways of actually communicating how to fix the problem instead of making excuses absolutely absolutely i, I agree 100 percent. and one of my major talk one of my major talking points is personal responsibility i believe every person male female whatever i believe every person must first be responsible for his or her own actions mm -hmm. and then once we can get to the point of accepting responsibility for the outcome of our situation then what we can do is we can put ourselves in the right company so that we can become accountable to one another. I believe wholeheartedly that men need to be around men that are healthy for them to thrive. Like we should be like, I mean, you know, just pushing each other to be great. That's just what I, I believe wholeheartedly. Men should never get to the point of just accepting complacency as a way of life. Once that happens, I believe that we've gotten to the point to where it's like we just we're just existing. We're just dealing with life circumstances and, and however they hit, it's okay. We survived this one. Let's hold on for the next one. And, and and I think that we have to continually build ourselves up as men so that we can not only be a, a good example for our children to follow, but also again that pillar of strength. Um, you know, so that we can actually be that go-to person within our household, within our communities. And this is, this doesn't take anything away from the women. I, I want to make sure I say that. Women can be pillars of strength as well, along with that man. I've seen perfect couples, I see couples that kind of augment each other perfectly based upon the communications that we have. And that's the thing that we're talking about here. We want to make sure that we arm these young men right so that they can actually be exactly who they're called to be um for their families and their communities exactly uh, because i think a lot of people will see us and they think oh that's the new uh little rascals he men woman haters club no we're not hating on women we just know that it's our responsibility to uplift men to where you can't say oh he's acting toxic or he's doing this or he's doing that because at the end of the day when you acknowledge your responsibility for something, everything falls on you. Yeah. So now when it's when the, the the lights not on, it's my fault. When the car's not working, it's my fault. I don't say, well, they doing this and they doing that. When I can't when I stop pointing the finger, then I can start thinking about solutions. Absolutely. And that's where we want to be a solution driven uh people. I like that. Solution driven people. Write that down. Everybody who's listening. Solution driven people. That's what we got to be. So in a in an attempt to help and and, uh, and, and I want to make sure I'm clear as we go forward and continue these conversations, because because what you're going to find is that today's conversation is all about you guys just getting to know us better. And then from week to week, we're going to come up with particular topics that we're going to talk about in specific details. Um, we're not saying that we have the perfect solution. We have a solution that can get these young men thinking in the right direction. I'm sure if they take what we bring to the table and apply their levels of thoughts, their upbringings, things of that nature, they will come to the perfect solution for them. But we just want to be able to provide a, you know, some sort of response, some sort of solution that help men, again, be, know, and do better. So I think that's kind of like where we're going. So Roland, what I want to do I did this last week on a previous kind of podcast. I had four, it was four gentlemen on there and we kind of talked about our background. So what I want to do is I kind of like want to, um, you both, you and I to share our background when it comes down to masculine development, like what did masculine development look like for you? You know, how did that translate into your adulthood experience? Like, do you lean back on some of that stuff now as a man? Like, what does that look like, sir? Wow. That's... I guess this is a format where we got to be open and honest and, you know, which would be best. I was born and raised in Detroit. Uh, my great grandmother was the the backbone of the family. And 
my parents both struggled with uh, substance abuse issues. Uh, my father, he was pretty Tony, running streets. Had uh, you know, I had a sister up the street, a sister down the street. Uh, so my male, early male role models were kind of skewed. I had a, a teacher, Mr. Chambers. He was a positive male male role role model for me, where he wanted you to recognize who you were. And he called everyone, you know, my brother, whatever your last name was, or sister, whatever your last name was. And through my young adulthood, I guess I did what I knew. The males that were in my neighborhood were, you talking pimps, gang bangers, and drug dealers. Mm. So, you know, you kind of fall in suit because you think that's what men supposed to do. And... I ended up uh, having children early because of that, and, but I, it, something in me said that I still had to take responsibility for my children, yeah. and that's why, you know, I ended up getting shot, and I knew I had to get out of Detroit, so I joined the military. Joined the military, and everybody was like, "Why you join the military?" This was around the time they starting off in Desert Storm and stuff. Yeah, I, I said, "Well, I got shot on the west side. I ain't get shot in the army, so." joined the military and I really didn't understand manhood for a male's role until I came across a new father figure in my life and he helped instill in me uh, values that men should have yeah. and responsibilities to where I take those things because I can take the other things and I can use them but they'll be all destructive in nature right? because right. I saw what it led up to you know, with the children, the women, and this, that, and other. I saw what it led up to. But then uh, it was a man that took the time to not just talk to me, but learn me and help me learn a new way and bridge the gap from where I was to where I am now. And I'm still growing. I'm, I'm you know, I still got a little fool in me, like my grandma say, yeah. used to say. But I'm ever growing and I never use excuses as to why I did something. If I messed up, I messed up. Yeah. And I take the blame. I take the ownership of it. And I think that's where I am now, where whatever happens, I realize that I have to take the responsibility in order for me to call myself a man. I can't just say because I'm a earner, I'm the man. I provide, I'm the man. No, it's, it all encompasses everything. And when I say I'm a man, I got to take the responsibility of not just myself, but everything under my roof. Yeah. No, that was good, man. And I'm glad you shared that with us. And, and, and you're right. I, I apologize. I didn't stress that earlier. I want us to be initially vulnerable to those young men as they're listening to us, because I want them to understand that we're coming from a place of sincerity. Like this is not just something that we're doing just because, oh, you know, everybody got a platform. We got a voice. No, we really want to be a part of the solution because I'm sure you, you know, you can probably see it from your Fox. So, you know, just so that you know, Roland, he is actually in Texas and I'm in Georgia. And so I'm sure he can look at his windows and, you know, ride around his neighborhood and actually see the results of some of these upbringings and, and teachings and the way information is processed. And this is not saying that the parents are not doing a good job. We're not here to gauge or give them a letter grade. We just want to make sure that we continue to develop the, the developmental process of these young men. For me, I would have benefited from having something like this to be able to listen to on my spare time when I was doing nothing but listening to rap music at a young age. Um, something like, you know, a, a lot similar to you, uh, my grandparents were my backbone. I was fortunate. I had my grandfather in the house and, you know, my grandfather, I think, I mean, just to me, I thought he was awesome. He was the man. That's what we refer to him as, right? Um, but he was very, in his older age, um, very... Um, docile to a certain degree until he had enough once he had enough then everybody knew he had enough and then that was it um, so we used to call him the man because that's just that was like our interpretation of it. and I remember the day he he passed away um, it literally broke me down and then it just seemed as though a torch was passed from him to like my uncles and this started the uncle brigade in my life right so I had 
my mother's younger brother, not youngest brother, younger brother, Uncle Mike, who passed away earlier this year. God rest his soul. Um, so I had Uncle Mike. I had Uncle Glenn, who was married into the family. And then I had my Uncle Tony, who was my father's youngest brother, the youngest of six, actually. And so between those three men, I picked up a lot from them. So Uncle Mike, and I said it before, like he was like the closest thing I knew to Eddie Murphy, man. The young man was handsome and he was hilarious. And women would just call him all the time. And I'd be answering the phone, hello, am I speak to Mike? He's not here. You know, hello, am I speak to Mike? Like, are you the person I called five minutes ago? You know what I'm saying? I was young and doing dumb stuff right. like that, right? Um, but one thing I knew is that, you know, he carried himself like with a high degree of um, confidence. I mean, like I said, women love him and he was hilarious. And my mother let me spend time with him. You know, we would fight, you know, kind of play fight, you know, kind of. In his mind, he was toughening me up. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, you look at stuff like that, I appreciate stuff like that. Um, because hindsight being 2020, he wasn't trying to do anything to hurt me. He was just trying to, you know, prepare me for life as it comes. That doesn't make it wrong. It just makes it different. My uncle Glenn, he was different. My uncle Glenn, he married my aunt Betty. And one of the things I can tell you about my uncle Glenn is that he took care of his family. He was a hardworking man. And every Sunday he took his wife out to eat. And I was like, man, this is awesome. So I'm looking at this and I'm processing this information. And then another thing on Saturdays, I'm always with my Uncle Glenn and my cousin, right? And we're going to the YMCA. So we're going to the YMCA and we're going to work out, play basketball. And then immediately following, we're going to Burger King, bro. And let me tell you something. Those days, like it meant something to me. I look forward to every Saturday because that's what we got to do. But I was spending time with my uncle and that was cool. I enjoyed doing that. And then transition to my Uncle Tony. Like, this guy's in a special category. This is my dad's brother, youngest brother. So we're kind of closer in age. So he was kind of like an unwritten brother of mine, but I knew he was my uncle. And like I shared previously, he kind of shared some information with me that stuck with me ever since. And he, you know, I was trying to be a little knucklehead and get out there in the street and do some, you know, some unhealthy stuff, right? Um... And somehow he always showed up. And one day he pulled me aside and he said, stop. He said, leave these streets alone. These streets are not for you. You were destined to do something greater. Go do that. And I don't know what it was, man. It was almost like a light bulb moment, but the light wasn't clear yet. It was just there. And so, you know, shortly after that, you know, I kind of went the college route. My mind wasn't right for college yet. Then I joined the army. Um, the reason why I joined the army because my son came along. Um, and at that point I was like, you know what? I can't call myself going to college and working at the same time, working on minimal sleep and then still be, you know, there for my son. And that's when I joined the army full time. And so first duty station was Fort Stewart. Um, and I would say that he and mom, he and me and his mom didn't really work out well. We were still young. Nobody ever gave us a blueprint on how, you know, what relationship looked like. We still trying to figure out life. And the most important part of it, we're still trying to understand who we are. And that to me was the biggest key. So we didn't make it. Um, and I would tell you that the next integral male figure in my life was my platoon sergeant right there at Fort Hood. And it goes by the name of Tony Majors. And he did something to me that made the light bulb moment that my uncle Tony shared with me come full circle. Because I'll be honest with you, and I shared it with him on the podcast that we have. And if you haven't seen it yet, go look at the podcast called Labeled Disenfranchised Fathers. And I actually shared the same thing with him then. I didn't really like him because he was like focused on me. And I thought I was good at what I was doing. Like, I, you know, I thought I was the man. But when he showed up, he just started tightening screws and tweaking this and things of that nature. And it was a little uncomfortable and I didn't like it. And so Antoine Reese... He came and he said, hey, man, I need to talk to you real quick. He said, Majors is, you know, he re may really like you. I said, mm, yeah, I'm not seeing that. <laughs> and so one day I'm coming to work and Majors came, Majors showed up. He said, hey, man, what you doing for lunch? I said, nothing. He said, well, you and I going to lunch today. Okay. Man, I'm telling you, what he shared with me at lunch changed my entire perspective of the young man. And that's why we have a great relationship to this day. He sat me down. He said, I know that you feel I'm hard on you. And I was like, yeah, you are. He said, well, he said, the reason why, not that I need a reason, but the reason why is because I see so much of myself in you. 
And he said, I don't want you to make the same mistakes that I made coming up through the ranks. And I just kind of leaned back because this wasn't the conversation I was anticipating. You know what I'm saying? I was looking for something a little bit more stern, a little bit more, you know, rugged. But in essence, what he was trying to share with me, and this is how I conceptualize it, is that I kind of view you as a son. So I want you to understand this. Don't make the same mistakes I made. Be better than me. In fact, he actually shared, shared those words right there. He said, be better than me. He said, don't be arrogant. Don't be stubborn. He said, you're very smart. You're good at what you do. He said, learn how to mentor and not bark. And from that, it just seemed like it changed everything for me. Like, I mean, I'm not saying it's like instantly, but it took a minute and I processed it and I processed it. And so I greatly appreciate people like my Uncle Tony, my Uncle Mike, my Uncle Glenn, my grandfather, and Tony Majors, because all of those men were very influential in my life because they took the time to add value. And, I, and for me, I think it's only right that we take the time to add value to them. Um, so I know it was a little long-winded, man. I apologize for that. 